Hey everybody, Daryl and Holly with Exquisite Exotics here. Holly laughing on the camera already. I got her cracking up. Um, so, yes, last week we did a, a reach out on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube asking for questions. We'll do a little Q&A video this week. So, we have our questions here. Um, we're going to go ahead and just get started. So, we're going to start with Instagram. Instagram, we had uh, three questions for one person. Uh, Kyler2305. The first question was, is it bad that my ball python doesn't tongue flick all the time? And I have questions here on the paper, so sorry if you're the paper rattle. Um, they can see it. <laughs> yes. So I would say no, but I, I, I would say it depends what you define as all the time. If your ball python is out and about exploring, typically they would be tongue flicking because that's how they smell and they want to sense the area around them. Um, if they're just in their enclosure sitting there, no, they're not tongue flicking all the time. They might get an occasional tongue flick once they kind of get um, more... Alert that you're near them or something's going on that's not normal. Yeah, yeah, but if they're just like sitting there on the ball, they might not be tongue flicking. So I don't know how often your animal's tongue flicking, um, but if they're out and exploring, yes, they should be doing it regularly. It's not like it's constant, like nonstop, but regularly, yeah. Yeah, I'll agree. No. I agree. I'm going to check with Holly after every okay. question. I don't know if that's a um, good idea. Give my approval. <laughs> what made you want to start a reptile business? So this is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. um, so I was looking at um, opening, doing something different with my life. Um, and I thought I had always had a passion for reptiles and amphibians. And I thought it'd be really cool um, to become, to do something with reptiles. Uh, I looked at a whole bunch of different options of what I could and couldn't do, knowing that I already had a full-time job, that uh, financially I couldn't just quit my job and go back to school for eight years for something. Um, so I had to, had to really get creative with options. Um, the reptile business was something that allowed me to work with reptiles and and fill a passion that I had. It also um, provided us an opportunity to start our own business, which is something we had talked about many, many times with starting our own business, which was not my original thought process when I was trying to figure out what I could do with reptiles, but it kind of led us down this path of, hey, you know, we've talked before about starting our own business. Uh, at some point, we're going to retire from regular jobs uh, and it would be nice to have something to do in retirement, you know, a little extra income and keep yourself busy because you don't want to get bored in retirement either. So there were a lot of pros to starting our own business. And since I was already looking for something reptile related to do career, I say career wise, uh, this was just kind of the natural flow of where, where my ideas led. Holly, you got anything you want to add to that? Um, I think that the way that you've planned things out, too, um, Daryl is fortunate enough that even before all this crazy stuff was going on in the world, he could work from home. Um, and the way my job works, um, as much as it's a great job and I love it, uh, this could possibly replace the income someday. Possibly. And um, I could possibly end up me running the business full time and still being able to spend time with you because you'll be working from home at your job, possibly. <laughs> Again, these are all, you know, things up in the air. And so that way we can spend more time with each other too. I think yeah. that's a yeah, definitely big factor. More time together was a factor of why we'd want to do this. So, so that's it, all. That's it was a, just I mean, you know, everything you said was good, good but I mean, just at least on my end, um, it would be nice to kind of run everything full time. Yeah. And still be able to have, you know, my evenings with you. Yeah. And maybe to get add on to what Holly said mm -hmm. and get a little more to know us. Um, I'm slightly older than Holly. Not by a lot, but, you know, I'm older. And I was looking at going into retirement probably at a younger age than Holly plans to do so. <clears throat> and I was looking at a retirement earlier than her by myself. And I was like, I don't like that idea. So one of the things we talked about having our own business is... You know, even if I retire, if Holly's running a business, but it's here in our house, I still can spend every day with her, even though I'm in retirement and she's still technically yeah, I mean, working. I think in the beginning, it was a 10 year difference yeah. like, between him retiring and me. Yeah. So, um, so that was, that was <laughs> you get 10 years of, you know, 10 years of being alone. Didn't sound, didn't sound appealing. Oh. So anyway, getting a little personal there, but <laughs> that was a big, yeah. 
that's part of the decision too. So, all right, next question. Uh, still from Kyler two three zero five on Instagram. Why doesn't my ball python go to the cool end of its hide? That's a good question. Um, I, I would start by checking your temps and see what the temps are on your cool side and your hot side and make sure it's not too, too cold on your cool side. We keep our cool side at uh, just around 80 degrees. Um, so I make sure it's not too cold on that side. Also, um, I would say during the day, most of our ball pythons, unless you know it's a breeding female and they're cooling, yada, yada. Um, most of our female or most of our ball pythons stay on the hot side during the day, but at night they tend to meander around to different places in their uh, enclosure. So, uh, including when we kept ones in tanks back back when we first started. Um, so, I would also check at night to make sure that they're not going to that side at night. They might be going over there and you're just not seeing them because it's dark and you just don't realize it. So, something to keep an eye on. Maybe they are doing it, but just you're not seeing it. Uh, also check your temperatures on that side. They should occasionally be going over there. It's not like they go over there very often, I would say. Most of the time they're on their heat, but occasionally they should be going over mm -hmm. there. All right, moving on to YouTube questions. Oh, did you have anything else to add on that last one? No. Okay. No. I mean, you're, you're pretty accurate though. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we'll open a tub and the same ones are up in the front, but it's also when we're checking. You know, yeah. we're checking at certain specific times, so that's all. Uh, all right, moving on to YouTube questions. So, uh, Sammy Tutson. Mm -hmm. We'll go with Tutson. Okay. Hopefully I pronounced that right. Uh, my ball python was listed and sold as a male to me, but this tail looks like a female's. How do I make sure of its gender? We well, can't really tell from the tail. Um, there's two surefire ways to know whether your ball python is male or female. You can either probe them or you can pop them, which is inverting the hemipenes or lack thereof um, on your ball python. So we have a video on popping. So that's out there that you can go look at. And it's called uh, Popping Ball Pythons in Three Easy Steps, I think is the name of the video. Uh, I will try to remember that. I'm terrible at remembering that stuff. She's telling me to do stuff that I'm gonna forget. Um, but you can search for it. Um, there's lots of other popping videos out there from people, or you can probe it. Uh, disclaimer on both of those. I would not pop the first time you're going to pop ball, ball, ball python by yourself. I would not probe the first time you're going to probe by yourself. Uh, both of those things do have the possibility of injuring your animals if done incorrectly. I, I would recommend finding somebody local to you who knows how to do one or the other or going to a vet because a, vet, a reptile veterinarian because the veterinarian should be able to do one or the other. Most veterinarians that we've gone to and we've went to quite a few reptile vets at this point, um, they tend to probe, not pop. So. Just, yeah. So those are two methods. Um, probing is basically you stick a probe in the tail and see if there's any or not. If the probe goes in deeper than there is, if it only goes in shallow, there's not. So same thing, just checking to see if there's any Um So that's the way you tell. Uh, there are videos out there to do both, but I do highly, highly recommend if you've never done either one before that you have somebody else show you or you just take it to a vet and have them sex it for you. All right, next, uh, Cool Kylie. We got three questions from Cool Kylie. First, what's your favorite reptile? Me first? Oh, I like <clears throat> first. Um, so for me, I love tortoises, um, specifically the Sulcata tortoise. It's one of those kind of things where I don't exactly stay very professional around them. <laughs> I get really giddy and like childlike because I find them really adorable. Um, most tortoises in general, I love. Um, as well and the only reason I don't even have one <clears throat> is because uh, of the lifespan that they have. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm trying to clean my throat. I'm sure that I could will it to somebody that would absolutely love and care for it but um, right now I'm, I'm too old <laughs> to have it for a lifetime. Um, that's the other thing too, that's kind of what you know I love about Daryl is on the flip side we have a lot of turtles in our area and he'll stop and stop the car and get a turtle out of the road if uh, I do do that. I you have. Know, he I has have, turtle gloves in every car that we have. I have leather gloves be, in every. Because some car. of them are snapping turtles too. So most of them are snapping yeah. turtles that I'm saving. Yeah. So um, that's one thing that I like. So tortoises, yeah. but turtles and tortoises, I yeah, is my favorite. You. By the way, I'm gonna interject for a second. It's a terrible reason not to get one, just because it'll outlive you. Well, we also would have a hard time finding a spot to keep one. In fairness, but we just if, throw them around the if house. If you want one, we should talk about that. <laughs> um, okay, for me, I'm going to pick a reptile that I've loved ever since I was a little kid, uh, and I cannot own, a, <laughs> a Komodo dragon. I love Komodo dragons. I have ever since I was a child. Honestly, if you want to 
probably picked the thing that got me into reptiles. It was probably going to a zoo the first time and seeing a Komodo dragon. I thought they were amazing. Plus, I do have, I'm all that Holly held this for a second. I do have a fascination with anything that named dragon in it. Um, I had my first reptile was a water dragon. Tattoo, dragon, tattoos, two dragons. I maybe have a small little thing about liking dragons, and it's a Komodo dragon. So <laughs> how could I not fall in love when I first saw it as a kid? So. Komodo dragon's my favorite. Yeah. Uh, ooh, this is a tough one. Do you like breeding ball pythons or crested geckos more? I can ooh. answer that easy for me. For me, it's... It is tough um, because both kind of bring a different excitement, but it's definitely ball pythons because I think that when you are putting a pairing together and when the time finally comes that the eggs have pipped and you're cutting and you're looking at them and you need to know what, what are you going to get, I think that's probably the most exciting, especially seeing their little heads pop out of the egg. It's kind of adorable. So to me, I think that, you know, that, that part of it is probably my absolute favorite part of it. But then also during the entire breeding season, when you're checking on, you know, your males and females, once you put them together and once you see, anytime you see a lock, it doesn't matter how many times you see a lock in your entire life. Every time you see a lock, you get excited because you know that that's the potential for future clutch. So that's, that to me, that that's why, that's what I like more. I, I think I'm going to go with ball pythons as well uh, for two reasons. One... I tend to like the ball pythons better than I like crested geckos. So if I had to pick a favorite reptile of the two, I would probably pick ball pythons. So that tends to lead me to like breeding them more. I think the other thing is you only get eggs once a year. Assuming you even get eggs. You get eggs once a year. So it's more exciting when you get a clutch of ball python eggs because you're like, I've got my eggs from that female for the year. Versus geckos, they're laying every like 30 to 45 days. Ours tend to lay like at 28, Couple of them are, 25. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. They lay super quick. Um, so you're getting eggs all, all the time, like all the time with our crested geckos. We're like, oh, look, there's eggs today. And you just put them in the tub. And it's like, it's not a major occurrence. But we get ball python eggs. It's like, holy crap, we got a clutch. Let's go get the tub ready. Let's go film this. You know, it's it's... It's much more exciting to me when we get a clutch of eggs. So I think I enjoy the breeding experience more with ball pythons than crested geckos. Not that I don't love our crested geckos, but I think I enjoy the experience more with the ball pythons. All right, last question uh, from Cool Kylie was, what's your favorite ball python morph? Oh, well, that's, that's actually tough for me. So this used to be really, I'll go first on this yeah. one. This used to be really easy. I would tell you pie, like every time, pie, 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 pie. Uh, but that's gotten tougher the more we've done with stuff. I really like Desert Ghost a ton. Like, it's quickly becoming one of my favorite genes to work with. Um, but if I had to pick one, I think I would still pick Pied. Because I think as cool as Desert Ghost is, seeing a Desert Ghost Pied would be even cooler. Like, no matter what I would think about at any time, if I think, like, you know, what would that be cool with? Oh, that'd be cool if it was pied. It's always, it would be cool if it was pied. So I think I, a pied has to be my my go-to. That's too funny, because I was kind of thinking the same thing. Oh, I'm, I'm, that, no, that's, well, that's I'm a snake around. inside no, there. No, I thought Holly's oh, flicking no, a no. clip again like she was last week's video. There's a snake nope, moving around behind I'm us. I'm not touching right, anything. <laughs> um, I kind of thought the same thing. I thought, you know, it's really tough to pick a morph, but... Almost any morph looks cool when you add it with pied, when you get that um, patterning. And then, and honestly, I, I think I like a medium white pie, uh, pie ball, not necessarily too, too little. And we do have two that have like a lot of white, so they're very high white. And as amazing as they look, they just have a tiny little bit of patterning. So I kind of like a good mix. Um, I think if I were to pick something with them, our banana pie is probably my favorite um, looking pied that we have, um, but then also Ultramel is beautiful every time, I, in any, any time we see them. Just plain Ultramel, I think, is really beautiful. So, yeah, probably, I guess, um, I'll say pied as well, just because I like, uh, same as you, I like to, the combination yeah. pied and something else. So I'm, I'm with you too, medium white. If I want a pied, I want to see the other colors with it other than just the white. Mm -hmm. But I also want to see the white, so mm -hmm. that's my goal, it's mediums. Um, okay, moving on to uh, Jimmy from the Python Burrow. If you guys don't follow Jimmy from the Python Burrow, he also has a YouTube channel. Go subscribe. Great guy. Um, what made you guys switch from saltwater to reptiles? 
So Jimmy and I are actually fairly local to each other. We've met up before. Uh, he actually helped us the first time we were trying to learn how to pop, going back to the question about how do you sex your animal. Um, so I used to keep saltwater aquariums. I had saltwater aquariums. I had two of them. I had them in total for probably eight or nine years, I'd say, between the two. Something like that. Something around there. Ever since um, we were in this house. Yeah, so some, something around there, seven, eight years, maybe, between the two. Um, anyway, so I absolutely love saltwater aquariums. And um, I shut down my saltwater aquarium when we started the reptile business. And the reason was time. I just knew that if we were running this business, working full-time jobs, and where we wanted to go with this business, there was no way I'd be able to keep up with this and keep up with the saltwater aquarium. That being said, I, I, I will have one again, absolutely, at some point in my life. I highly will tell you, I'm constantly <laughs> watching talking about it. videos. I have, I'm working on my dream setup um, plans. Like I'm working on how I can create uh, an aquarium that is very, very low maintenance so that we can work it into our schedule. Um, so I will have one again, but I just knew with everything it takes to start a new business, there just wasn't going to be enough time for me to care for it the way I would want to. So unfortunately it, it had to go. It was really sad. I miss it. Um, I had, a for anybody who's watching this, who is in the saltwater aquariums, I had a, my favorite thing about my aquarium was I had a mandarin dragonette that, dragon. Uh, dragon, of course. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah. uh, Mandarin Dragonette. They're gorgeous fish. If you haven't seen one before, you look up uh, a green or sorry, a blue Mandarin Dragonette. They are absolutely beautiful. Probably one of the best looking fish, hands down, in the world, in my opinion. Um, and uh, they're notoriously picky eaters. Uh, mine would eat anything. You throw in mice, shrimp. You throw in cyclopes. You throw in whatever, and they would eat it. They eat pellets. They eat freaking pellet food. Um, it was a fat, happy little mandarin dragonette, and we had it for like three years. Mm -hmm. um, and it was one of the hardest things about getting rid of the aquarium was seeing him it go. It was pretty hard. Let yeah. that go. But anyway, uh, so I will have one again. Uh, but just time constraints. I, I just knew it wasn't going to be feasible to keep it and do this at the same time. So another one is in my future, though. Better than even my last two. I will say, every time I've started a new one, it's been better than the one before. So, it's only twice. You but, go. You um, do with what you learn, right? Then the, yeah, the next one will be even better and way less work, too, because I have a lot of plans on how to make it very automated. No water changes by hand anymore. It's too much work. <laughs> um, next question from Random Potato, which I love your name, by the way. Uh, is it bad that I hold my snake every day? Um, so, I would say not bad. I wouldn't hold them right after you feed them for about 24 hours just to make sure you don't mess up the digestion. Just a general good practice. Um, so maybe not every every day. Uh, but I would also say it depends on how your snake is reacting to it. If they seem stressed, um, if they um, seem like they all of a sudden stop eating or anything, I wouldn't be handling them every day then. It depends, I would say very depends on the reptile and how they handle being handled. If they handle it well, then it's okay most days. Um, we may, again, maybe not right after feeding, but I probably wouldn't do it every single day um, with feeding. And if they're not handling it well, absolutely they need a break. So it really depends on how your animal handles it. No, no, I mean, I, it seems like it's, you know, an animal that you've had established. So, I mean, the only other thing I would say is probably for the first week when oh. you get a new animal, don't handle them. Don't kind of get in their face, especially if you receive the animal via um shipment and not went to or even definitely a show too because all of those things stress an animal out and especially reptiles they don't handle stress very easily so um when you get a new animal i would definitely keep the um i would definitely keep them kind of like to let, let them to themselves what i'm trying to say leave them alone for probably about a week maybe always says a week i would have said two two yeah i mean let just to least... let them at least establish themselves in their new home and surroundings and smells and things like that so yeah. Let them settle in for at least two weeks before you start But, if, but the way the question's worded, in my opinion, is that you've already had them, so that's not really a... Yeah, a factor. That's a good, that is a good addition. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and last one from DJ Skullball Pythons 1. Why did we choose the racks that we house our snakes in? This is kind of a, a three-parter question, but it all ties together. Why did we choose the racks that we house our snakes in? Why not PVC and the reasons? So... Uh, actually, we first started with PVC for our ball pythons. 
So, and our geckos are actually in PVC racks, and we have a couple PVC racks. They're off camera to the side that have some ball pythons in them, um, and our blood pythons in a PVC rack. So we started with PVC racks. Uh, sea serpents, if you guys are looking for PVC racks, highly recommend Chris. Great guy, good quality racks. Um, he can custom make racks, which he's done for us as well. So that's what I would recommend for if you're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so we started with PVC racks. I would say TGR, but they're no longer. Yeah, I like the TGR racks, but unfortunately they're they're shut down. Um, so uh, for ball pythons for TGR, but our our geckos are in uh, PVC okay. racks, um, and the reason I switched to metal racks for ball pythons is a, a couple reasons. Um, first off, I love the tubs from Freedom Breeder. That's one of my big things about these tubs is the having the tub with the cup holder is really really nice. Um, PVC does sag over time, um, so there are some disadvantages to it. There are other advantages too with cost. Cost of PVC racks is, is, tends to be cheaper. Um, I like the, the way these tubs slide in and out a little better than I do on the PVC racks. And then I'm going to get my, my engineering hat on, so I worked in engineering for my career. Um, these are made of stainless steel. I believe they use, uh, if I remember correctly, they're using 304 stainless steel, which is a type of stainless. Um, either that or 316, but I'm pretty sure it was 304 when I looked it up last. Um, 304 stainless steel has a really, really high corrosion resistance. The likelihood that these racks will ever rust or deteriorate is slim to none. You know, PVC racks, like I said, they do warp a little bit over time. Um, these racks will outlive me, definitely. Uh, and the there's, there's a definitely an advantage to having a rack that you know that I will have this rack as long as we breed ball pythons. Nothing will ever happen to this rack. I don't ever have concerns with that. Um, also, the resale value, if you ever look at, hey, you know, if the business doesn't work out, the resale value on these is really high as well because they're so well made. Um, so stainless steel racks are, to me, my mechanical engineering side of my brain says that's the way to go for something that's going to last longer than I'm going to last. <laughs> so there are a lot of other advantages too. I will say um, uh, being able to pull out the, the top plastic piece here, I will give you an example. So can you see up? Yeah, you guys can see up here. Let me pull this off real quick. So if you have a female who lays a clutch of eggs and you want to get the smell out, on a PVC rack, you got to reach your arm up in there and try to reach all the way back to the back, clean it up, and make sure there's no smell on the top either. Uh, to get that female eating again. And that, for somebody who's short and doesn't have long arms, is a royal pain. <laughs> but it's not a pain if you can just pull out, can I see? Yeah, the top here just pulls out, right? So you can just pull that out, clean it, and then put it back in. Um, and I'll put that back in in a second, but I don't need to waste time in the video showing you guys put it back in. Um, but uh, that is another huge advantage of these racks over the PVC racks as well. Anything else? Um, nope, I'm, I'm finance, so to me this is a good investment. <laughs> That's how I look at it. You know, you spend a lot of money on Freedom Breeder racks. Uh, obviously they're not cheap if you've ever looked into them, or if you've purchased one, they're not cheap. Um, but like Daryl was saying, if you give all those reasons on how it's going to last, it's a good investment piece. It is. So. And that was the last question. Mm-hmm. All right. So that's it for the Q&A. Um, These are great questions, guys. Thank you so much for... Yes, it's exact, yeah. <laughs> exactly what I was going to say. Thank you for submitting your questions. This video wouldn't have been a video without questions. So. All right. Holla, anything else? No. All right. We'll cut it off. I know this has been a long video already. So as always, guys, like, comment, subscribe, all the YouTube stuff. Um, if you're new to the channel, this is your first video, make sure you watch for our for sale videos. Uh, they get, All of our animals go for sale on YouTube first. Uh, and you get a discount if you buy them in the first week. So you get a week of them exclusively on YouTube and you get a week of a discount. So with that. What can you ask? Yeah. We'll, we'll talk to you all next week. Have Take a good care. Weekend. Bye, everybody.